Can Selena Joe ever figure out a way to get out of her backwoods life? Edgar Valentine Smith, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. The vintage episode for the week is The Kiss by Anton Chekhov. Be sure to check it out on Tuesday. If you have found value in the show, please become a monthly supporter. Help us to help other folks like you. Please go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a monthly supporter for as little as $5 a month. As a thank you gesture, we'll send you a coupon code every month for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. Thanks for helping us out. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a supporter today. Today's story won the O. Henry Memorial Award in 1923, but it was written by a relatively unknown writer. Edgar Valentine Smith sold two stories to Harper's Magazine in his brief career as a writer, Prelude and Lija. Not much more is readily available about him. There are many things notable about today's story. The craft of the story is very elegant. We are effortlessly drawn into the descriptions of the heroine's early life. We sympathize with her so much in her efforts to improve herself. Interesting how her big break is crafted. I hope you like it. Just a heads up, the N-word is used a couple of times. Just a heads up. And now, Prelude by Edgar Valentine Smith. When she was 15 years old, Selina Joe was doing a man's work in Pruitt's Turpentine Orchard. Properly, though, her story begins earlier than this. It was shortly before his daughter was born that Shug Hudsill brought his young wife, Marthy, to a sandy land homestead, 25 miles from the nearest railroad, in that section of the country which borders the Gulf of Mexico. There followed shortly the inevitable log rolling at which the neighbors, mostly Hudsills themselves, contributed their labor. Shug furnished refreshments in the form of shinny, an unpalatable but unusually potent native rum. Otherwise, his part in the erection of his future home was largely advisory. Despite this, though, the house, a two-room cabin of the saddlebag type, was soon erected. Hand-split pine boards covered the roof, and gave fair promise of keeping out the rain. An unglazed window and a door in each room, which would be closed with rough wooden shutters during inclement weather, served for ventilation and lighting. A stick-and-clay chimney at one end of the cabin gave outlet to the single fireplace, which was to answer the dual purpose of cooking and heating. By devious methods, Shug accumulated two or three runty, tick-infested cows and a few razorback hogs. These were left in the main to shift for themselves. There were tough native grasses available, and the cane breaks in Shoalwater River were close by. During severe weather, such of the cows as chanced to be giving a few pints of thin, watery milk daily were fed a little homegrown fodder and corn on the ear. With probosities inordinately sharpened for the purpose, the hogs probed for succulent roots in the rank undergrowth of the nearby swamp. When hog-killing season arrived, Shug would shoulder his gun and slouch away for his winter supply of meat. Neighbors charged it against him that he was not always careful to see to it that they were his own shoats which he killed. Since it was a simple matter, though, to snip off the telltale ear markings of a dead pig, his pilferings, if a fact, were never proved. Corn sprouted slowly in the thin soil. It grew up dispiritedly and came to maturity stunted as to blade, stalk, and ear. Sweet potatoes yielded generously in new ground. Each year a fresh plot was cleared, broken, and planted to these. A patch of sugarcane was always grown for molasses. A portion of this, it was generally conceded, 
was finally made into shinny, since Shug was known to be an adept at its manufacture. Certain it is that he made frequent extended trips away from home with his wagon and yoke of oxen, never troubling to explain the reason for his absence. It was amid these surroundings, sufficient in themselves, one would have said, to hinder physical, mental, and moral growth, that the girl, Selina Jo, was born. The occasion was in no sense of the word an event with Shug and Marthy. Since all married people of their acquaintance had children, a baby simply represented to them the inevitable. With the birth of the child, though, Marthy became barren. For the first eighteen months of her existence, the baby crawled about the cabin unnamed. Then it occurred to Marthy that their offspring ought to be christened. Shug, she suggested casually. Seems to me we ought to be naming that there young'un. Shug, lolling in the shade of a water oak, shifted his quid and spat disinterestedly. I ain't objecting none, he replied. How about calling her Selena Joe? Marthy asked. Fitting enough name for her, I reckon? Shug yawned. As the child grew up, she came to accept her parents as they had long since accepted her, merely as a bald fact. There was never the slightest evidence of parental affection upon one side or of filial attachment upon the other. Once more they came upon Shrug whipping the girl with a switch. What you whipping her for? She asked. Her tone was one of simple curiosity, nothing else. All oh, young'uns needs it. Shug replied virtuously, and he tossed the switch aside. Hadn't been my daddy used to wail me powerful, I wouldn't have been nigh the man I am now, not nigh. It was a matter for remark between the parents that, even at a tender age, Selina Jo rarely emitted any outcry under punishment. There burned in her slow black eyes, though, the flame of an emotion which she checked upon the surface. One would have expected the girl to respond to the influence of heredity. Her parents, the cattle, the hogs, even the crops about her, were stunted, half-starved in appearance. By contrast, Selina Jo, upon a daily ration made up almost exclusively of corn pone, molasses, and home-cured pork as salt as ocean brine, defied all known dietary laws and flourished amazingly. She was precocious, too. When she was only seven years old, she could swear just as well, rather just as wickedly, as could Shug himself. She learned early, though, that as a source of information, her parents were practically nil. Thenceforth, the questions that had rushed to her lips were succeeded by a look of eternal interrogation in her somber eyes. It was shortly after her twelfth birthday that a young schoolteacher, the only one the community ever knew, came into the Hudson settlement. Selina Jo was grudgingly allowed to attend the school. For six months, the young man's enthusiasm held out. Then it waned and died. Few of the older people could either read or write, and the opinion among them seemed to be universal that what was good enough for them was good enough for their offspring. But before the school closed, Selina Jo had learned the alphabet and a portion of the old-fashioned first reader. She missed the school, and she always kept, close at hand, her thumbed and dog-eared book, the only one that she possessed. The schoolteacher had lighted the fires of ambition, within her. She came to be troubled by the realization that her mental development was lagging behind her physical growth. Selina Jo, she informed herself one day in a fit of musing, you're as poison strong as a gallon of green shinny, but you don't know scarcely nothing. A moment later, she added dejectedly, I ain't got no chance at learning neither, not nary a particle of a chance Shoalwater River afforded her chief means of diversion. She never remembered when or how she learned to swim. Every day that the weather permitted, she enjoyed a plunge in the river. Soon she noticed that no less pleasant than the contact of the water with her naked body was the comfortable after-feeling of cleanliness. Following this came a feeling of repugnance toward her shiftless and slovenly parents. She had long since begun to assist with the crops. With the manure scraped from the cow lot, she made the beds for the potatoes. 
At planting time, she pulled the slips and set them out. She hoed the sugar cane and thinned the corn. During harvest, she did almost as much work as Shug and Marthy combined. Before she was fourteen, she had broken a pair of young steers to the yoke. She split the rails and laid the fence for a new potato patch. Using for the purpose the young oxen which she had broken, she prepared the ground for planting. She was as tall as her father now, a slender, wiry creature, her symmetrical young body as free from blemish as the trunk of a healthy pine tree. A vague unrest troubled her at times, though. Something occurred one day which intensified this. In a corner of the cabin she found a dust-covered photograph. Brushing it off, she gazed upon a face that was unfamiliar. She took the picture to Marthy. Ma, she asked, who is this? Her mother glanced at it indifferently. Me, she answered listlessly. You? Selina Joe gasped. Yeah, rather it used to be. Took when I married your pa. Selina Joe scanned the comely, pictured face for some likeness to the slatternly creature who had given her birth. Wild resentment against something, she scarcely knew what, flamed in her heart. Suddenly she dashed the photograph to the floor and hurried from the cabin. As one reads the chronicle of her words, it must be remembered that her vocabulary was patterned after that of her father. Oh, God Almighty, she burst out tempestuously. I don't want to be like her. I ain't going to neither. Her acquaintances were limited to a score of families, most of them relatives, and all of them mental and moral replicas of her own, who lived nearby. There was an almost abandoned church in the neighborhood, where, at rare intervals, some itinerant preacher held services. Upon one occasion, though, Shug took the family to preaching in what was known as the Briggs Settlement, which was ten miles nearer the railroad. It was here that Selina Joe had it impressed upon her young mind just how people of her stripe were looked upon by those cast in another mold. Shortly after they had seated themselves in the church, Shug, uncouth and unshaven on the men's side, and she and her mother on that reserved for her sex, Selina Joe heard one of the women whisper to her neighbor, Some of that Hudsell tribe. As the girl caught the slur in the words, her face flushed darkly. She began to notice the unfavorable looks with which the men of the congregation were regarding her father. Even the children stared superciliously toward her mother and herself. Puzzled, vaguely hurt, at first she wondered why. Lingering just outside the church at the close of services, she waited, shyly hopeful that someone would speak to her. No one paid her the slightest heed. In a land where a lack of hospitality was the one unpardonable sin, this alone was enough to convince her that something was terribly wrong somewhere. But she held her peace until they had completed the tedious homeward journey. Ma, she demanded abruptly, as soon as they were alone. How come we ain't like other folks? What are you talking about? Marthy intoned querulously. Them folks in that there Briggs settlement. Well? They looked slantwise at Pa when we went in and sat down. Selina Joe waited a moment, her face clouding at the thought. And them little old gals looked slantwise at me too, Darnum. How can I help the way people looked at us? Marthy whined. Treating us that a way just cause we're poor? Tweren't that neither, the girl insisted stubbornly. Them men, most of them, was wearing overhauls. The school teacher said rich folks don't wear them kind of clothes to meetin'. Trying to get better than your raisin, are you? Marthy suddenly showed unwanted spirit. Well, gal. You can just make up your mind to be like your poor ma, and I ain't going to be like you. The words shot out with sudden passion. I ain't. God a mercy. Marthy's usually expressionless face showed a trace of surprise at this outburst. But I've always said, seeing lots of things gets notions into youngin's heads what ain't good for them. And that ain't all I seed neither, Selina Joe retorted. 
they didn't, none of them folks, not nary one of them, asked us home to eat a Sunday dinner with them. At the conclusion of the church service, she had seen invitations to the noonday meal being extended and accepted right and left by the Briggs Settlement householders. Since it was the custom to include the various stranger in these, the fact that none had been offered her people left room for only one conclusion. The Hudsills were looked upon by their neighbors as being unworthy to receive one. Slowly the impression fastened itself upon her brain that her family was hopelessly low in the social scale. Poison low down, she would have phrased it. His conviction gripped her. It stung, and it stayed with her. Fortunately, something occurred about this time to divert her thoughts temporarily. Three miles from Shug's home, Pruitt Brothers, turpentine operators, established a woods commissary. Selina Joe's first visit to the store left her gasping with pleasure. Filled with the usual gaudy assortment carried in stock by the general country store, to the half-starved eyes and soul of the woods-bred girl, the place was a wonderland. Dress goods and loud patterns dazzled her sight. Very colored ribbons flaunted themselves tantalizingly before her gaze. But the one thing that charmed her, that held her spellbound, was a cheap, ready-made gingham dress. She made frequent unnecessary trips to the store, merely to feast her eyes upon it. She would look from it to the faded homespun that she wore and sigh enviously. Once she even mustered the courage to ask the price. It was an insignificant sum, but the thought struck her with sickening force that it might just as well have been a thousand dollars. She had never owned a piece of money. Slowly, as her yearning for the dress became almost unbearable, a plan formed in her mind. Coming in from her tasks one day, she found Shug, just returned from one of his mysterious periodical trips. Pa, she said timidly, I, I got a hankerin'. Suppose you have. Shug's manner was more surly than usual. A hankerin' never heard nobody yet. But, but I sure enough want something. Wantin' and gettin' is different things. What is it? There's the prettiest dress over to Pruitt's store, Selina Joe began eagerly, and it's made out in real gingham. Gingham? Shug whirled about with a snarl. What are you talking about, gal? Selina Joe's heart sank. I ain't never had nary one, she offered placatingly, and I ain't never liable to neither. Homespun's good enough for your poor ma, and it'll have to be good enough for you. I ain't going to be working myself to skin and bone to be fitting out no young'un in fancy riggins. But, Pa, it don't cost much. It costs just that much more than you're going to get. Shut up! It was then that Selina Joe unfolded her plan. I'm going to get me that air dress, she announced dispassionately. I'm aiming to pay for it myself, too. How? You're earning the money at public work. You? Shug snorted derisively. Where are you getting any public work? In Pruitt's turkentime orchard. There's a heap of work I can do. I can do scraping or dipping. Reckon I could even do hacking. Shug had slumped into the one comfortable chair in the room. Turning his head, he glared at his daughter. You're not going to work in no turkentime orchard, he rasped. You're going to stay right here and help you pull ma and me. I told you once to shut up. It struck Selina Joe suddenly that life was, somehow, terribly one-sided and unfair. Other girls in the community, who didn't work as hard as she did, were beginning to wear gingham dresses for Sunday. She thought bitterly that, in return for her slaving, she had received bed and board, nothing more. By everything that was right, she reasoned, she had earned at least one store-bought dress. Yet it was roughly denied her. Some of the thoughts which had been haunting her for months struggled for expression. Her soul cried out against what was a patent injustice, but she managed to speak calmly. Fur as I can figure it out, Pa, 
she said. I've been doing my share of keeping this here family up. I broke them last yoke of steers, and one of them you was afeard to touch. I've split rails and laid fences. I broke new ground. And the first time I asked for anything, you say I can't have it. She ceased speaking for a moment, but her steady gaze never left Shug's face. Now I'm going to work for Pruitt, she continued slowly, till I get me the money I need. Something must have occurred during Shug's recent trip, probably a hurried flight from officers, to increase his normal perverseness. He had risen from his chair. Taking a heavy leather strap from the wall, he started towards Selena Joe. You are, huh? Advancing, he fondled the strap suggestively. You'll get a larrup and that's what. With the first evidence of her father's intention, Selena Joe's face had flushed a brick red. Now it paled suddenly. She had not even been threatened with corporal punishment for years. Wild rebellion surged within her. A carving knife lay upon the rude deal table beside which she was standing. One slim brown hand dropped down beside the knife. Her emotion visible only in the tumultuous heaving of her breast and the white, set expression of her face. She waited, motionless, her dark, somber eyes gazing unwaveringly into Shug's face. Paul, she said evenly, just you touch me once with that strop, and as sure as God gives me strength, I'll cut your heart out. An innate coward, Shrug recognized a danger sign when he saw it. The hand which held the strap dropped to his side. He backed slowly away. You, you, he sputtered and stopped. You and Ma have been saying, Selena Joe continued, that I'm trying to be better in my raising, but I ain't forgot how them Briggs settlement folks looked at us slantwise. Weren't cause we was pies and poor neither. They knowed somehow we was plumb low down and ornery. That's why they didn't none of them asked us to a Sunday dinner. They seed we was trash. Of course I'm honing to be better than that kind of raisin. And I'm going to, too. Shug had retreated to the doorway, where he stood watching this new daughter of his with furtive, fearful eyes. The meanest of petty tyrants, when he held the whip hand, doubtless he expected that Selina Joe would exhibit the same trait. There was nothing of the bully in the girl, though. Threatened with what she considered to be undeserved punishment, she had simply acted upon the dictates of her immature mind and had seized upon the only means at hand to escape it. It was several moments before Shug mustered courage to speak. Since you're going to do public work, he whined presently, Tain't nothing but right. You ought to pay for your bed and board. Selena Joe was glad to agree to this arrangement. When informed of it later, Marthy sullenly acquiesced. She would have to do the housework now, which was no more to her liking than the realization that Shug would permanently pocket the money for their daughter's board. It was the next day that Selena Joe sought out Lige Tuttle, woods foreman for Pruitt Brothers. I'm looking for a job, she announced bluntly. Sorry, Tuttle answered brusquely. All our cooks are niggers. Cook? was a scornful answer. I ain't asked him to be no cook. I want sure enough work. Tuttle smiled patronizingly. What can you do? Scraping, dipping, or hacking? was the confident answer. You? Tuttle laughed softly. Well, that's a man's work. It's hard. Any harder than breaking bull yearlings to the yoke, or splitting rails and breaking new ground? Mean to say you've done all that? I most bardaciously have. Labor was scarce at the time. Tuttle considered the girl's request carefully, asked a few more questions, and decided to take a chance. What's your name? he asked. Selena Joe? What else? It was the first time Selena Joe had ever been asked her surname. She felt the blood rush to her face. What's your last name? Tuttle repeated. 
The answer came almost inaudibly. Hudsill. Shug Hudsill's young'un? How can I help it? The girl burst out passionately. If you'd have been born to Hudsill, you'd have to be one too. Don't get mad, child. There was something in the spirit of this strange creature that Tuttle could not understand, but he respected it. I wasn't aiming to low-rate you none, just because of your daddy. Come here tomorrow morning, and I'll try you out. Selena Joe found that the work was hard. The dry, slippery pine needles underfoot made walking itself a task. She carried a heavy bucket into which she dipped the raw gum, emptying the bucket, when filled, into barrels scattered about the orchard. From sunup till sunset, and later, she toiled. Not once, though, did she grumble. She was too foolishly happy. What she was undergoing was a prelude to real existence, as she saw it. What better, she asked herself, could any strong, healthy girl desire than a steady job dipping turpentine for which she was paid real money? Occasional passers-by, strangers to the vicinity, amazed at seeing a girl engaged in such unusual work, would pause to ask friendly questions. The first flush of pleasure that this gave Selina Joe was quickly erased by the bitter aftertang of reflection. These people were kind because they did not know she was a Hudsel. While with practice she developed skill, it was three months before she had saved the money she needed. The gingham dress had been laid aside for her, but her ambition had soared. A beautiful dress above a pair of bare legs and feet would never do. Then, too, since her only item of headgear was the sunbonnet which she wore every day, she would need, besides shoes and stockings, a hat. The day came at last, though, when she could make her purchases. With her arms filled with bundles, she started out joyously on her three-mile walk home. A half-mile from the commissary, she paused indecisively at the crossroads. The right-hand road, leading to Shoalwater River, meant the lengthening of her journey a full mile. But the river, with its promise of a cooling plunge, enticed her. As she stood, hesitant, trying to decide, she observed a stranger approaching on horseback. She drew aside to let him pass, but he reined in his horse and hailed her. Evening, little sister. Live hereabouts? Down the left-hand fork pace? Selina Joe bent her steady gaze upon the stranger. Who are you? I'm Holmes, sheriff of the county. Instinctively, the girl drew back. What are you wanting of me? I ain't done nothing. Lord bless you, little sister, the sheriff laughed. Not after you. Thought maybe as you live round here, you might tell me something I want to know. It seemed that a murder had recently been committed in the Bayshore country ten miles distant. Circumstances pointed to the guilt of two men who had been arrested. Assuming that the murderers had passed through the Hudson Hill section en route to or from the scene of the crime, the sheriff was seeking evidence to prove this. Strangers were enough of a rarity in the neighborhood to be remembered easily. Selina recalled two men who had passed that way, whose description fitted those charged with the murder. Sheriff Holmes was elated. Would you like a trip to Eastview? he asked. Eastview? Selina Joe's heart skipped a beat. That's town, ain't it? Where the railroad trains is at? Yes. We want you there a week from today. The sheriff filled in a blank subpoena and extended it to the girl. Look me up in the courthouse soon as you get to town. Selina Joe's breathless announcement that she was going to court created a flurry at home until Shug learned why she had been summoned. Then he breathed easily. It was decided that she could use the oxen and wagon for the trip, as Eastview was twenty-five miles distant. This method of travel, being slow, would necessitate an early start on the day before the trial. When that day dawned, though, one of the oxen was found to be indisposed. Selina Joe assembled a lunch of corn pone and side meat, filled a small bottle with molasses, and dressed in her new finery, set out on foot. Within an hour, the new shoes began to pinch. She took them off, tied them together by their strings, and slung them over her shoulder. The stockings were rolled into balls and stuffed into her pockets. 
Late in the afternoon, she bathed her feet and legs in a brook just outside Eastview and donned shoes and stockings again. It was dusk when she arrived at the sheriff's office. An overflow crowd at the single hotel necessitated her staying with Sheriff Holmes's family that night. With the inborn timidity of the woods-bred girl, she remained there until summoned to court in the late forenoon of the following day. By the time her evidence was concluded, though, she had partially overcome her shyness and was ready for sightseeing. Wandering about the interior of the courthouse, she marveled at the white plaster walls. Then she watched several people using the sanitary drinking fountain. Presently she found courage to try it herself. The technique she found to be rather difficult, but after she had mastered it, she became a frequent patron. Later, she ventured outside the courthouse. Sheriff Holmes found her during the noon recess. She had commandeered a small goods box which she was using as a seat. Her enraptured gaze was fastened upon a scene across the street. Three large, two-story frame buildings, painted a dazzling white, stood upon a lot which occupied an entire block. Beneath the branches of huge water oaks were scores of girls, dressed in white blouses and dark blue skirts. Sheriff Holmes smiled understandingly. Like it? Selina Joe did not even turn her head. Whose is them air little gals? she asked breathlessly. The States, for the present, was the answer. Who? The State. That's the reformatory for girls. It was plain that the remark conveyed no information to Selina Joe. Do which? she asked. When girls, young ones like you, break the law, the sheriff explained, they bring them here to be reformed. What's reformed? Well, it's like this. Before they let a girl go again, she has to prove that she's been changed for the better. Changed? Selina Joe looked up with a quick indrawn breath. They make him different from what they was? Yes, that's about it, I guess. Do they learn him out in books in there? Oh, yes, they have regular hours for study. And could... Could a gal get in there what didn't know nothing but a part of the first reader? You don't understand yet, child. It's only for girls who do wrong. Now a girl like you never would go there. Selina Joe sighed dejectedly. Her eyes caressed the buildings with their spotless white walls and wide-flung shutters, and the groups of girls scattered about the lawn. Presently she pointed to a high iron picket fence which enclosed the lot. What's the fence for? she asked. Why, for that fence wasn't there, little sister. Half the girls there would lie out before midnight, the sheriff answered. They'd run away? Selina Joe shook her head incredulously. From them purty houses? Since it would be impossible for her to reach home that day, she spent another night with the sheriff's family. In her dreams, she saw white painted buildings fashioned of real lumber. There was real glass in the windows, too. They weren't just yawning black holes in the walls. And the chimneys were of brick, so different from the flimsy stick-and-clay affair that leaned drunkenly against one end of the cabin at home. Home. She seemed to sicken at the thought. Her dreams were peopled with girls in white blouses and blue skirts, thousands of them, it seemed to her. They were all within an iron-fenced enclosure, beckoning to her to enter. And she was always just on the outside. With morning came thoughts of her work in the turpentine orchard. Inexplicably, a vague dissatisfaction awoke within her. The idea began to burn itself into her consciousness that, though she might spend a lifetime in honest toil there, she would always be referred to as one of that Hudsill tribe. Apparently there was no escape from that. During breakfast she was unusually quiet and thoughtful. With a shy acknowledgement of thanks, she accepted the liberal lunch provided by the sheriff's wife and made her adieus. Two miles outside the town, she left the highway. A hundred yards from the road, she seated herself upon a log and grimly prepared to wait. Darkness had fallen when she again entered Eastview. 
and cautiously approached the reformatory from the rear. She scaled the iron fence with comparative ease. Crouching low, she crept toward a lighted window on the ground floor. Two girls of about her own age sat at a study table. Standing before the window, Selena Joe spoke. Can I come in? she asked softly. One of the girls screamed slightly. The other, after her first involuntary start of amazement, seemed wonderfully self-possessed. Sure, Rube, she invited cordially. Step right in. Selina Joe climbed over the low window sill into the room. What you doing here? One of the girls asked. I'm joining this here reforming place, was the unruffled answer. You what? Very simply, Selina Joe made known her intentions. But you'll be caught sure as shooting, one of the girls objected. In the first place, you've got no uniform. Naturally, Selina Joe expected to be discovered sooner or later, but she had prepared for this eventuality, as she thought. Maybe we can fix that, the other girl broke in eagerly. There's that old blouse of mine and your extra skirt. Gee, I wish we could put it over. Wouldn't old Iron Jaw be wild? Between them, they rigged a uniform for Selina Joe. At the nightly inspection, she crept under the bed. Later, she slept on a pallet. The fortunate indisposition of a girl across the hall solved the breakfast problem. Selina Joe, taking the vacant place in the formation, passed undiscovered for the moment. Among the many contingencies which she could not have provided against, though, were the sharp eyes and keen memory for faces possessed by Mary Shane, the matron in charge. As the girls were forming for certain duties shortly after breakfast, Selina Joe felt a heavy hand upon her shoulder. She looked up into the stern face of the matron. What are you doing here? was the curt inquiry. Me? Selina Joe's attempt at surprise was ludicrous. I, I belong here, ma'am. You do? You ought to know me then. What is my name? Instinct told the girl that this must be the matron. Old Iron Jaw, she answered, unabashed. Mary Shane smiled grimly. Come with me, she ordered. She led the way, Selina Joe following meekly to her little cubbyhole of an office. Now then, the matron commanded sternly, tell me the truth. How did you get in here? I, I clumb that fence. Why? Just cause, ma'am. I naturally gotta get reformed, was the perfectly serious answer. I really belong here. I'm so poisoned mean, they ain't no other place fitting for me. What is your name? Now it came, not hesitantly, but proudly, even defiantly. Selene Joe Hudsill. Mary Shane knitted her brows thoughtfully. Hudsill? Yes, am Them low-down, sneaking, ornery, shoal-water river Hudsills, ma'am. Everybody in the country knows about them. They are the shiftlessest family that ever was born. And what's furthermore... I'm the hell raisinous one of the entire generation. What are you trying to tell me, child? Just how tarnation mean I am, ma'am? In her plans for forcibly entering the reformatory, Selina Joe had hit upon the idea of charging herself, when her presence should be discovered, with an assortment of crimes sufficient to ensure her incarceration for an indefinite period. It seemed to her now that the moment for her confession had arrived. Last month, ma'am, she continued earnestly, I burned down three cow stalls. Right after that, I went into my own blood uncle's cornfield and pulled up every smidgen bit of his young corn. Pulled it smack up by the roots, ma'am. Now that ain't all, not now all. I almost hate to tell you this, ma'am, but last week, I stabbed a little nigger baby to death. Killed him dead. Dead as... Hush, child, hush, the matron ordered. You did none of those things. Now then, tell me the truth. It came, then, the truth. The story, haltingly told of a child's scarcely understood heartache for self-betterment. Selina Joe didn't want to stay in the reformatory long, she said. Only long enough to learn all there was in the books. Then she would be willing to leave. 
she would change her name and go away off somewhere. Maybe the folks there, not knowing that she was a Hudsel, would invite her to Sunday dinner when she went to meeting. People, some of them, rather, said of Mary Shane that her long association with the so-called criminally inclined young had rendered her immune to every human emotion. But as the recital progressed, the matron turned her back suddenly and strode over to a window. Presently the story was finished. And please, ma'am, a voice was asking helpfully, I can stay now, can't I? Mary Shane did not reply for a moment. I'm afraid not, child, she said presently. Few who thought they knew her would have recognized the matron's voice. You... You've done nothing to be kept here for. You'll have to go home. Then it was that Selina Joe's heart broke. She flung herself upon the matron. Oh, God, ma'am, she sobbed. Please don't make me go back. I ain't going back. I don't want to be one of them low-down hudsels all my enduring days. I want to be somebody like other folks is. I don't want to have a passel of dang little old gals looking at me slantswise when I go to meeting. You don't know what it is, ma'am, to have a hankering. I want to be changed. I want to be made different. Ma'am, I just got to get reformed. Mary Shane had opened her mouth to speak, to check this outburst. Suddenly her iron jaws closed with a snap. Come with me, child, she said. We'll see the superintendent. A moment later, she added, Jim Wellborn generally runs this reformatory to suit himself anyway. The matron was the one person connected with the institution who took whatever liberties she chose. When she wished to be particularly impressive, she addressed people by their full names. Jim Wellborn, she said brusquely, as she and Selina Joe entered the superintendent's office. This girl wants to tell you something. You listen closely. Wellborn, big and broad-shouldered, had glanced up as they entered. His quizzical glance had rested first upon the girl. Now he looked at Mary Shane. When you've heard her story, the matron continued, if you can't find some way to keep her here so she can learn to live the life that Almighty God has shown her that she's fitted for, why, I'll undertake the job of looking after her myself and the reformatory can get another matron. Hmm. Superintendent Wellborn's gray eyes twinkled, but he did not smile outright. Well, the reformatory is fairly well satisfied with its present matron. Good day, Mary Shane. Sit down, little girl. The matron closed the door and returned to her office. For nearly an hour, she sat, idle, at her desk. It was the first of the month. There were statements to be prepared, reports to be rendered, bills to be checked. But it was patent that her mind was upon none of these things. From time to time she glanced up impatiently at some noise in the hallway. Presently there came the sound of hurrying footsteps. She whirled her chair about. Selina Joe stood in the doorway. Questions? Answers were unnecessary. The flush in her cheeks, the flame of her slow black eyes, blazoned her happiness to the world. As she realized what the superintendent's decision had been, an answering light gleamed momentarily in Mary Shane's face. Characteristically, though, it was quenched upon the instant, as she slipped once more, automatically, into her habitual mask of granite. But even a granite mask, since it is only a mask, cannot stifle a heart song. At best it can only muffle it. For as she went about the prosaic business of acquainting Selina Joe with her duties, Mary Shane was well aware that, somewhere, deep within herself, a small voice was chanting, chanting over and over, For this one... Just this one, Lord, who comes of her own accord to be changed. For this single one, 
who wants to be made different. I thank thee. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Prelude by Edgar Valentine Smith. If you've enjoyed this episode, you may also enjoy Tickets, Please by D.H. Lawrence, available for free in your podcast feed. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. (laughs) 